Ladies and gentlemen, on this YouTube channel, I cover games of all sorts of different varieties, whether that's beginners submitting meme games to me, or some of the best players in the world. Well, in this video, I'm actually going to go through old scorebooks. Uh, these are notebooks uh, with like 50 to 100 games from my childhood. Uh, I have some of them still in storage. Uh, we're gonna go through three different games at three different stages of my life. I'll tell you all the lore about it and all those tournaments. And I hope you enjoy. Uh, honestly, it's kind of a special video, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, Baby Gotham is the protagonist. This first game is played in Hunter College High School, which is a chess tournament place that exists for many, many years. Um, and my, my opponent is named Joseph. Uh, the, it's, it's October 5th, 2003. This is the first year I'm ever playing chess. I'm seven years old in 10 months. And I begin the game with e4. This is round number one, and this is actually the first game in the scorebook. Um, Hunter is a very popular, famous chess uh, school chess tournament here in New York City. So knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, baby Gotham doing all the good stuff. I like this, bishop on c4, active, out and about. Opponent responds with bishop c5. Now, back in the day, I just kind of learned my openings from studying Chess Life magazine. Um, I didn't really have any books. I played against my dad. I didn't know about the Evans Gambit. I didn't know about the Joko Piano. I didn't know about the Fried Liver. Um, although maybe I did know about the Fried Liver, but in this game it was Bishop to C5. Uh, but I didn't know any Gambit, so I just decided to castle and finish my development with Knight C3. So this is like a position, this position, extremely popular at scholastic level because kids are just taught the principle, so you get total symmetry. And then I was taught that you can break the symmetry with the move H3. Of course, then an expert player of symmetry will play h6, and then you really get confused. Then you don't know what to do. Then oftentimes you will trade this bishop for the bishop on the diagonal. I don't know if nowadays this is very common for symmetry, but back in the day it was. So here Joseph uh, offers me an exchange of bishops. Uh, I oblige because I'm, you know, 1100, I'm 1090. So it, basically if I can take something, I should, no questions asked. Uh, I mean, it's not a, necessarily a bad decision because opponent is now left with doubled pawns. A move like knight to g5 is not very good here. It's just kind of a one move threat. Black just goes here. You have no way to add any attack and you're just gonna get kicked out. Um, so here I took the opportunity to develop my bishop to g5. Uh, not a very good move, but for a very advanced reason. Uh, it's not a very good move because even though my bishop can be attacked, you would think that you slide back to keep the pin, but there's probably a situation where this kingside attack is actually very strong for black because uh, I'm not going to sacrifice. Uh, there's no need to do that. If I slide back here, my bishop doesn't really do anything. It's not like it pressures the center whatsoever. And actually black can, in a move... Uh, oh, sorry, even right away, uh, begin just using the open F file. Now, I don't think that Joseph and I were quite aware of the density of the middle game plans. I think I was more like me need move bishop because me no move bishop. And Joseph was like, well, me trade pieces because me trade pieces. So Joseph plays D5. Now, again, I'm 1090. So if I can take something, I'm going to take it. Not a very good decision. Uh, because these pawns are completely doubled. So this pawn is not threatening anything. And what I mean by that is if this pawn were to take on e4, this would permanently freeze these e pawns. If the pawn were to go to d4, that would still permanently freeze those pawns, except the position still remains closed, so I can't just go gobble gobble Pac-Man on them. It's very important that you don't make your opponent's life easier. And I helped him undouble his pawns. In my defense, which I don't know, I haven't spoken to myself, 50, like, what, what is that, 18 years in the past, maybe I thought that I had this, 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 which is why some people play certain moves, because they see something, but my opponent doesn't need to take with a queen, he can take with a rook or the pawn. Of course, the rook would be better, because the rook maintains pressure on the file, and you don't open up your king unnecessarily. So, I don't know. So I went to attack his pawn. Joseph, very principled here, defends his pawn. Okay, very good. Uh, now I actually play probably my most impressive move, of the entire game because now I actually can take on f6 uh, and queen f6 knight d5 so I would be forcing him to do this but I play an even more impressive move arguably I'm going for positional chess knight jumping out to the edge of the board in order to trade for the bishop because my knight is worse than the bishop bishops are slightly better than knights yeah and he goes here and I take and now with that very simple transaction I have improved my position because this bishop no longer attacks the center and no longer targets my king and um, I mean, the position is still objectively very balanced. The problem is that now that that one to two move plan is over, it's time for baby Gotham to find another one to two move plan, which is 
unbelievably difficult as a 1090. Um, so I decided to move upon. And I'm sure what I calculated here was that, you know, it's a fair trade. Now, I probably would have blundered this in the game, that after knight takes d4, my queen is what we call overloaded. So rook takes e1, and I'm going to lose a piece. I'm willing to bet I would have blundered that. Maybe not, but I got very lucky because my opponent actually just moved his queen forward. And now you know me. I'm going to take stuff. So I took on e5, but then here, very impressive, I did not take... And I noticed that the queen and the knight were right there, and I had been training my tactics, and I played the move bishop to f4, coming off this knight, and now black is under some pressure. Of course, I could have done this in a more advanced way. So I could have done this in a way where this knight can't take my knight with check and just completely get out of the pin, which I must have overlooked. I can actually sack my rook. This is a very common way to do things like this, because for a temporary material sacrifice, now there's a little bit of a problem. Uh, and if black just plays something like knight d7, uh, well, you can just stockpile the pressure for the rest of the game. So queen here, queen e2. Queen e I mean, this is just lost. Black is just going to be lost. Probably queen h5 is even more precise so that the rook cannot even go to e8. Yeah, that's, that's pretty brutal. Um, of course, even in this sequence, there is the move rook to e1 check, which is how pins work. You just sack the rook and get the bishop. But white is better in this endgame uh, after queen e1, queen f4 because of queen e6 ideas and like mate potentially. So, uh, but you know, we're going a little bit off the beaten path. Let's go with the one move pin, takes, takes. And now again, just without even thinking takes, takes. Now that's not good because you don't want to give your opponent control of a file. Like if you have rooks staring at each other, probably it's a little bit better to just maintain the balance of the position. Uh, it, it might look like you're going to lose the a2 pawn. I think taking this is just simply too dangerous for black. Like, rook comes to the 7th rank. Rook on the 7th rank is just going to beat everything up. So, that's probably no good. But I'm 1,090, so I just take immediately and go c3. Position is still very balanced, by the way. I got to give credit. This is like two children playing a very balanced game of chess. White maintains an advantage because bishop versus knight endgame. So, this bishop is just simply... It's just better. It's just... Objectively... Uh, and then maybe in the future I can stockpile the pressure here. Here Joseph kind of gets all up in my face. I don't really respect that, so I kick him out. I think he must have forgot that uh, even though I can move my pawn, my, que my queen maintains defense of this. So he just goes back to c6. Uh, and here I play the move queen g3. Again, I'm, I'm seven years old, so when I don't know what to do in a position, I'm going to kind of go for mate. Like I must have thought that, you know, he's just going to go like here. Or, you know, not even. He'll go like... Uh, here, 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 and I'll mate him. Even though I obviously should just be moving my rook back into the game. Like, rook d1 here, no questions asked. Just bring the rook to the middle. Knight to the middle is not really good. It kind of gets in the way of everything. You can undermine the center here, and you can then create this, and it really helps you that your king is actually always safe on h2. Notice I made the getaway score for my king. But, you know, I'm seven, so I play queen g3 with the intention to play bishop h6 and queen g7 and checkmate, because that's the only thing I know how to do, just completely negating this. The problem is that here I miss an opponent's defensive resource, uh, and this is very important. You got to think how your opponents are going to put you in pressure. Knight h5, beautiful move. Queen is once again overloaded. We saw this tactic earlier, and now Joseph just goes a pawn up. I mean, very clean, nice little tactic, boom, boom, beating up children. Um, and uh, I move my rook to attack the queen, and here Joseph... Must have known that 20 years later I would be a YouTube comedian uh, because now he really, he employs danger levels. Actually, one might argue that Joseph is the original inventor of danger levels and plays rook to e1 check. Look at that fancy schmancy. Converting the endgame into a pawn up queen endgame with a pass pawn. So the way you win this with black is you put the queen behind the pawn and you advance it. Look at this. 1167. I go here because I don't know what to do. And now he, 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 look at this, he even makes the fort for the king. And then he just pushes. And at this point, I'm like, damn it, I got to get back. And then he, he just keeps pushing because now B and C are going to come together. And as long as he has a decoy, he's completely winning. I try to run my king. I don't know what that was. I mean, that doesn't make sense at all because he's going to play C4 anyway, but I'm doing my best. And then look at this C, look at that beautiful move, which is why I needed to block the pawn a further distance from the back rank than two squares, because then I would be able to take this and still get back in time, but now I'm not able to. 
So I go queen d1, and then here I do something completely illogical, but I suppose this was my way of resigning, or I don't know, I trade queens? Which kind of doesn't make sense. Even if I could get my king to... Like, even if I was able to get here, this is still completely lost because I'm glued to these pawns. Now, if I was somehow able to win both pawns, yeah, I would be surviving. But trading queens there was a... <laughs> and listen, uh, my opponent is probably also a child, so... Uh, when you can get two queens, you have to. I mean, y you gotta. Uh, and then he just mates me in the center of the board. But, but... I won King of the Hill, all right? So, Joseph, you suck. You absolutely suck, and I won King of the Hill. So, actually, I won this game. Now, the interesting thing about Joseph, if, if I actually pull up the uh, his rating graph, is that um, he quit chess two tournaments after this one. So, he played against me, and then the next tournament that he played a week later, he did very well, and a month after that, he lost 55 points in a tournament in New York, and then he quit. He never played a chess tournament again, which is not uncommon, actually, for children. I like to sometimes go back and see, like, some of these people that I played when I was younger. Joseph played one more tournament, two more tournaments, lost 50 points, and was like, I hate chess, I'm done with it. So that's kind of what chess is like when you're, like, just starting out. Okay, game number two. Um, here I'm playing uh, at the age of eight. It's November 2004, so I'm almost nine. I'm almost nine. Uh, I played in Nationals right around this, but this tournament is a is an event that I played at the Susan Polgar Chess Club in um, in Queens. She used to have a chess club. Susan Polgar, one of the most uh, accomplished chess players ever, the first woman to hold the Grandmaster title, uh, currently in St. Louis. She has a chess club in Queens, New York, and I actually have a picture on my Twitter uh, with Susan. So you guys should go like look up Gotham Chess Susan Polgar. It was like one of my tweets a long time ago. And I'm playing an individual whose rating is 1696, according to my score sheet. Like I wrote li literally, and, and by the way, j j just so you guys see, um, this was a phase of my life that, oh, this was a phase in my life that I liked writing small. Look how small I'm writing here. I don't know why I, I did this. And look what I put for the rating. I put 1696 based on one tournament. Now, the interesting thing is my opponent's rating was never 1696 Ever. My opponent's rating at this tournament is 1715. I don't know where I got 1696. I don't know where my opponent got 1696. But okay. D4, D5, C4, E6. This is how I used to defend against the Queen's Gambit. Why? Well, it would play the Queen's Gambit declined. That's all I knew. All I knew is I would go here, and actually back in the day, I would play C5. Why? And this is this is known as the semi-tarash defense. So normally after C5, um, like you can trade in the center of the board, and the position is just very balanced. Uh, black oftentimes will take on d4, like many things will get traded. cd5 is very common, and uh, the super GMs like to play this line with bishop b4. I didn't know any of that. I was playing this because I was like, why does my opponent get to put two pawns in the center and not me? So my opponent took on c5, I did this, and he played bishop to g5. Um, so, um, this is already kind of looking a little bit suspicious uh, for white. Believe it or not. Um, and the reason is... Uh, I have d4. So if you can move a pawn into the center of the board like this early in the game, it's probably a good thing. You would think knight to e4 is good, because I can't take, but I can. And this is the problem when you weaken your king so early. So this sometimes happens in queen's pawn positions. And then like knight d2, I just take. So white has to lose the queen. Now we each have a hanging piece. But if my opponent runs away, I'll just take the bishop. So I'm just going to be a piece up. So I could have won the game, like, very early. But I didn't know that. So instead, I was like, well, me need, to, me need to waste a tempo moving this here to pin this. I don't know. What a bad move. Even as a 15-50, like, just castle if you don't know what to do, you bozo. Like, attack the bishop. Like, I don't know. Um, anyway, I go here. Opponent thinks he's winning my bishop, which is also not smart because now he helps me develop and he goes here opponent must have thought that bang 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 oh sorry bang 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 that's what he probably thought um which doesn't work whatsoever because i can just take on c3 and now again probably one of the better moves here for black is just to castle like just castle because if the opponent spends all this time taking they have no development at all you can just kick them out you can go queen a5 i mean this is a very unpleasant position to play with white um 
But of course, you know, I'm like, I got to trade Queens. Opponent is higher rated, so got to get them to an endgame. Now we have pieces fly off the board. Knight g4 is a terrible move. It's a terrible move because you attack my pawn, but you have a hanging pawn. But I invented danger levels, not to be confused with Joseph, who uh, merely thought about the idea. I actually patented it. F5. Now there's a hanging knight and a hanging pawn. So knight e3. And now I could take on c4 and trade knights, but you can also just delay that for a second, Mr. Baby Gotham, and then do this. And you're just a clean pawn up, and this knight is the dumbest knight of all time. So instead, of course, I trade knights because I'm like, it doesn't matter. Um, and a4 is a great move because on the one hand, you can play e3 and look for my pawn, but then I'm just going to play b5 and then defend my pawn. So opponent just decides no b5 for baby Gotham. I'm like, no, I insist. I'd really like to play b5. Thank you very much. And then I just decide to protect with my rook. Uh, here opponent goes rook b1. Now that's a tricky move because if I take the pawn, he's going to take on b7. I probably should still go for this and use the time that he's going for my pawn to either just castle or just go belligerently attack the king. You know, that's probably the way to go here. Um, I don't do that. I play b6. The problem after rook b4 is that I'm probably going to lose my c-pawn. However, I can prevent that by tactical means. I can make it so that he can't really take. And what I mean by that is uh, I have the move rook g8, so I would cover this. And if g3, then I can play here, attacking the rook, and then I can play bishop d5, something like this. So a nice little sequence there. Although bishop c6, there could be this move. Uh, the other benefit of my position is that I always have king e7. So while my opponent is so stretched in trying to look for, to take my c-pawn, I can play very simply. And the problem is these two weaknesses. So for example, bishop c4 loses on the spot. He cannot take with the bishop because the rook has to guard the bishop. a5, black wins. If rook, c, if rook c4, then we have takes, takes, and either this, this, or just the very straightforward bishop takes a4. So believe it or not, this attack on c4 is a total illusion because it would open up more prospects for me. Of course, I'm eight years old, so I found king e7, but I did not find a5. For some reason, I didn't see this move, even though it's a move that creates the maximum amount of danger. It can be difficult to spot moves like this. Instead, I play bishop c6, which not only covers my rook's attack on the bishop, it also facilitates white's development with short castle. Of course, I go rook g8 because I see the one mover. He just goes g3. And now, once again, I play a move that simply doesn't make any sense, h5. Which looks logical because you're like rook, pawn, king, but I don't have any threat. This pawn is way too well protected. I have to focus on the pawn structure weakness and lack of coordination of white's pieces, which is just not something that you do as a child. There is no such thing in your mind as his pieces are very poorly coordinated. Like, let's put it this way. If rook, bishop, pawn, pawn are arranged in a Tetris piece formation, probably not going to work like ever. Doesn't matter where they are. If the pawn is here and the bishop is here, then the rook is stuck guarding two pawns. I mean, it's just never going to work. So. Of course, I play h5, h4, then I play like e5, and bishop b7. I don't really know what I'm doing uh, besides pushing a pawn to h5 and simply losing it. Like, I just completely lost this pawn a move later. And in my mind, I was probably like, well, now I see his weakness. Of course, in that time, I let him castle, bring his second rook, and win an extra pawn. But, you know, I'm eight years old. I get a, get a pass. He goes rook b3. His coordination is still very bad, so I start harassing him. He goes rook a3. I go a6, he goes here, and I offer a bishop trade. This bishop trade actually is really bad for black. It's really bad for black, even though it looks good, um, because what he should do here is sacrifice his weakness to target mine. And if I try to defend, what he should do over the course of time is either trade a rook or really insist that I take his c3 pawn. So if I take on c3, the major problem in this position is I'm gonna lose one more pawn, and he has a passed h pawn, like it's just a passed pawn, so I'm gonna have to constantly monitor it. Um, but he goes king f1, which by the way is a very professional move, I must say, um, because if, of course, we trade, then my, the king gets closer. I play b5, and now he trades, and trades, and says, I'm gonna go for your pawn. The problem with the way he did it is now I have this move. So now his terrible coordination and very passive defense, which are bad things in the endgame, come back to bite, because after king e2, I simply take. But here is where <laughs> it got a little dicey. 
First of all, I trade rooks, which I probably should not be doing. I should probably just keep my king on in the corner on g7. Um, but then he goes here. There is one and only one way to prevent losing this pawn. And I have to give this check. And the thing is, it, 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 it doesn't make you're like, how, how does this stop like anything? Well, rook c7, rook c3, rook d7. And I sneak into the second rank. And basically, once I'm here, I might even be playing this for a win. Because if I split the weaknesses, it could be a problem for white. A computer still thinks it's a draw. But again, an 8-year-old 1500, both of those things separately, will never find that. So what did I do? I played king g6 and then lost my pawn. You don't trade rooks here ever! King and four versus king and three is losing 99% of the time. Baby Gotham, what are you doing? And yet I drew this game. On my score sheet, the game ends here, and that's probably because we, I doubt we agreed to a draw. What happens in, in chess over the board when you get below five minutes, you don't need to notate anymore. That's so you can save some time, unless there's bonus time, which there isn't in the United States. We have delay. Um, but the game ended in a draw. I'm looking at the results right now. Uh, that was the only draw I had of the tournament. I drew Bratton Das, uh, player from Ohio. Now, the interesting thing about this individual, he's only ever played four tournaments. His rating... Uh, profile on, on US chess is unbelievable. He played two tournaments in Los Angeles, then he played two tournaments in New York, and one in Massachusetts. That's five tournaments. Never played again. 2008, last tournament, Massachusetts. I played a person that played like five tournaments in their life and then never played chess again. Fascinating. Also, I don't know how I drew this. This is like undrawable. For example, if black plays the move king to h5, white just goes forward with the king. Thing is, I can't go win f2. I just can't do it. I, I don't... The second that this happens, White needs to abandon all plans and push the H-pawn, which, which sometimes people forget. They get into like a pawn gambling, pawn gobbling competition, and then they like draw the game by accident because they just forget about their pawn. Like here, black just gets back in time and it's probably a draw. Actually, the best move is probably king g4. Yeah, because I get to f3 faster. Um, but uh, yeah, we drew. What a battle. Spirited battle from start to finish. And let me show you the final game that I have for you. Game number three. Uh, this is against Jake. Now I'm 10 years old. This is January 2006. And this is a 50-minute game at the Marshall Chess Club. Um, at this point, uh, my handwriting is, a, is, a, is bigger. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm notating uh, normally again. But these are games... And by the way, I like to put like little notes on my moves. Like look at G4 on move like 18. Question mark, exclam. I, I used to like to do that during my games. I also used to write like motivational things for myself. Um, like for example, uh, oh well this isn't a motivational thing, but this is another game from that same tournament. I used to write the opening. I misspelled the opening. It's called Ru Lopez, but it's Ru Lopez. And then right there I put AKA Bob. So I used to call myself Bob during games. Um, sometimes I would put young but dangerous at the top. You know, it is what it is. E4. C5, and I loved the Grand Prix attack against the Sicilian. Knight C3, F4, I had a book called uh, Chess Openings for White and Black Explained by Lev Albert, Roman Jinchichishvili, and uh, I don't remember if there was a third author. But I used to love to play it, even though I didn't know it past this point. So you play E4, F4, Knight F3. Now, you are supposed to play Bishop to B5, and oftentimes trade for this knight to damage Black's structure. And then you play d3, castles, and f5. And maybe I'm going to make a video on this opening in the future. I used to love this opening. I didn't know it passed move 5, though. I knew, like, almost no openings. So I would just do this, and I would set up my pieces like this. But this is a really idiotic setup. Because what's going to happen is black is going to threaten d5, and then d4. So knight e7. And here, if I play this move, I'm already losing, because it's a fork trick. So, like, take, take, here, d4, white resigns. Which has happened before, but, but, but at this point, I'm like, oh, I can't blunder that, so bishop b5. Like, stupid! How, how did I even get to 1675 playing like this? Ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Bishop b5. Anyway, b6, which also doesn't make any sense. I mean, just castle. Like, what are you doing, Jake? What are you doing? Why are you playing b6? This bishop is going to get out later with a6, b5, taking a little bit more queenside space. But, you know, we're, we're 1860 and 1670. We don't know anything about chess, so... 
you know, you think you don't know anything about chess. We don't know anything about chess either, and we might be a thousand points higher than you. You never truly understand anything about this game. Now I play d4. So I play bishop c4, bishop b5, d3, d4. And I did this because I saw this was a little unstable. You know, I thought cd4, maybe knight d4 put some pressure. Of course, now opponent castles. Uh, here, for no explainable reason at all, I take. Like, I don't know why I would do that voluntarily. I mean, I could just castle and wait to be attacked. I take and then play knight back to e2 with the idea of playing c3. Now, this position is already dead lost for white. Dead lost. Why? Because my position makes no sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Who's going to protect this? Like, for example, if knight a5, who guards this pawn? Say, Levy, that's very easy, just knight g3. Yeah, but here black has an incredibly strong move to activate this bishop. Don't say bishop a6. No, no. Pawn move. F5. The thing is, when you have a big boy center, but you're playing against two winged pieces, like bishops, like flank pieces, who just chill on the sides and <laughs> laser beam you, pawn breaks are going to ruin your position. So if I take on F5, this bishop is going to be a killer the rest of the game. You say, Levy, no, it's not D5. And I say, first of all, you're not even castled. What are you doing? Okay, Levy, that's not a problem. First of all, no, it's not. It's, not, it, it's completely a problem. You're completely lost. And this bishop can come alive in the future. You can only temporarily slow this down. Okay, and by the way, can we address this bishop? Hello? So pick your poison, crisscross applesauce. You get hit from both sides. So queen e7 is a little bit of a weird move. Opponent is just not very confrontational, like not doing it in the right way. I play knight g3 because, I don't know, I think I need to guard my center. Finally, I castle, and now the opponent has a big choice of pawn breaks, and they don't choose the right one. D5 kills two bishops at the same time after E5. E5 was an awful move, Jake. I hope you're doing well in life, but, but, uh, but D5, terrible. Did I say E5 was terrible? D5 was terrible. This is the one move. Now you, now you get no bishop. Now you get no bishop this way. How do you kill one bishop? Uh, two bishops with one pawn move, Jake. Unbelievable. E5. And now I need a pawn on F5. Like, that's my main breakthrough now. So how do I... How do, well, I need a pawn on G4. So in the middle of this game, first of all, I play b3, because I see he wants to go knight to c4. Now he really doesn't know what to do, so he tries to open up the c-file. Now I go knight e2. I'm like, let's go. I want to play g4, because he completely closed the center. He's got two bishops. He should be trying to open the board. He plays the move rook d7, which again just doesn't make a bit of sense. I think he's trying to double his rooks. Jake, I don't know what you're going for. I think you're trying to double the rooks here, but I just go g4. He doubles the rooks. I just come back. I'm like, what is all this? Like, where is he going? Finally, he justifies his play by playing f6. Just kidding. He doesn't justify his play at all. Um, cd4 would be the way you would justify your play here and then try to get into c3. That kind of makes sense. The thing is, I don't really know what's next. You can park your rook here. It can almost get trapped. I don't know. But he spends like five moves preparing a queenside play and then attacks where I'm stronger. I got like all these pieces here, potential rook, potential queen, and he's just, he's just opening up. Now here I play f5, and on my score sheet, after the move f5, I put question mark exclam, which is a dubious move. Now f5 is the top engine move. I thought it was dubious. Live at the game, I'm like f5, question mark exclam. Maybe I thought I was trying to do the other one. So if you put exclam question mark, it's interesting. F5 is a fascinating move. Head spinning complications here. He takes on F5. I take back. Now, if he takes on F5, he's going to get slaughtered because I'm going to take the bishop. I can slide my king over, bring the rook. It's bad news. So he takes on E5. Now here, I can just take back. I can also take with the knight. And I have the top engine move, bishop G5, utilizing the open diagonal. Now, if he takes, he just gets crushed. Because now I take this with no defense. So takes, takes, boom. And uh, it's, it, you're dead lost now because I just have two pass pawns in your position. This is just, this is never going to work. I'm going to throw my pawns forward. It's game over. Nice little transition there. If you don't trade bishops, like you play like queen here, well, now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to take. And now there's a big difference. There's a big difference of, of what we're doing um, because what happens now is, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. What happens now is if you take on e5, Take, take, bishop f4. Oops. And you say, Levy, I don't understand. I don't understand. All the way back here, if bishop e5, the same thing. Correct. 100%. If takes back, bishop e5, same thing. 
but takes back, he doesn't have to take on e5. He could take on f5, which is what he did in the game. Now, this still looks very good for me. I got a knight, hitting everything. He goes queen d7, and at this point, what I needed to do is realize I can defend this knight without moving it and throw in my other knight. Like, what the hell is going on here? I got two horses in the front of the attack. Queen h5 is on the way. If he just takes on e5, I go knight h6, and it's game over. Knight to f7, done. Rook to f7, uh, rook to f7, done. Game over. So he plays queen d7, and I move the knight the wrong way. I got really excited. I, see, I saw that I could attack stuff. The problem is I attack nothing after rook f8. And then here I played such a bad move. Oh, this is just, what am I doing? In the middle of the game, I just transfer the bishop to g3. I don't know what that was all about. But okay, I got a little lucky, and he went knight back to b7 looking to trade my knight. And apparently here, we both ran out of time of notation. We both ran out of time of notation. Um, so I didn't notate the rest of the game. I ended up losing this game. I can only imagine because this is a bit too awkward. Now, knowing myself, I probably took this knight just because I could. And this is just not a very good position because now your pieces don't have a lot of forward mom momentum. There is this move e6, to be fair, but there is just queen e6 here. And even though you win a rook very temporarily, like, just this goes to show you how powerful black's bishop is. Yeah, it's bad news. White is completely lost here. Um, now... I would have loved to show you a full game from when I was 10, but I was playing a lot of these tournaments that were 30 minute, 40 minute, 50 minute. I never finished the game in time. So, but here's a game that I played. Uh, well, here, here, th from the same tournament, I put my rating as Levy. I put my name as Levy and my rating as Levy. Fascinating. Um, but, you know, as I progressed from an individual who had just played a tournament when he was seven years old, uh, up until I was, you know, now, well, 12 years old is when I quit chess. Let's just, let's just start there. I didn't really, I didn't have like a structured training regimen. So what I did uh, as a child is I would play a lot online and, and I would study a little bit of openings. I would go, I played these tournaments. There wasn't really strong engines. So I was playing with my dad and I was reading Chess Life. I had one or two chess books and I would do a lot of puzzles. That was like my whole thing. I played a lot of chess as a kid because I loved it. And I just built up experience by playing many, many, many over-the-board tournaments. Um, so definitely not great opening stuff, but my tactics were able to kind of hold me together for a while. The age of 12 is when I discovered that I can't beat anybody above me anymore. So I wasn't beating any stronger players, and I was only beating weaker players uh, at the rating of 2,000 because my openings were really, really bad. So I quit for... Most of age 12 to 15, and when I came back at the age of 15, openings are what got me back into it. Uh, a book, Carl Kahn book, Grandmaster Repertoire 7 uh, by Lars Skendorf. And uh, openings have been the one thing that keep me interested in the game probably to this day. Prep, different variations, different aggressive ideas. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I enjoyed making it. And uh, this video is recorded on a Sunday, so I hope you have a great Sunday. Thanks for making it this far. Let me know if you did. Peace out. I'll see you in the next one. Get out of here.